Hello and welcome to episode 54 of the Sales Syndicate podcast. It is an unusually hot day here in Cardiff, but my lips have been blue because the office aircon is literally at, at max and it's uh, it's a bit cold in the office, I'm not going to lie. So we might actually have to open the windows to warm up the office because it's too cold. Um, but we're going to be talking about a prospect-centric approach to sales outreach today. But before we dive into that topic, I will hand over to my guest, Lauren, to introduce herself and the company. So over to you, Lauren. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Uh, my name is Lauren About. I am a manager of sales development at Snowflake. I've been here for a little, actually, I think two years today now. So I've um, been here for two years um, and currently seeing overseeing a team of reps who have responsibilities for two very specific verticals, our retail CPG vertical and our manufacturing vertical, um, but beforehand was also an SDR. So really excited to get into our topic today, Jamie, and talk a little bit more about how to keep the prospect right in the center of everything. And do you want to just give us a little bit of a background on Snowflake as well? Yeah, so um, Snowflake is a data cloud platform. Um, we are also very well known in the financial community for being one of the largest software IPOs, the largest software IPO in history. Um, so oftentimes you will hear, you know, financial stock market geeks talk a lot about, you know, how we emerged into the market. Um, but essentially we put your data all in one place. We get your data, you know, for large organizations as well as large, small organizations. We centralize it, make it more accessible and allow you to do more with the data that you have, not just your proprietary data but also with third-party data as well and I, I i as much as we don't use the product or i i'm you know based out of the the uk and stuff we see a ton of stories about snowflake um on linkedin and, and google and stuff yep. along the topics of the ipo or i think we read an article the other day about if you stopped selling you would still grow x amount year on year so you could the company could literally stop selling and they would still like just grow like rapidly which is which is mad that's where we all want to be right especially in the um, SaaS startups it's yeah it's mental yep that is the goal yeah it's been an so incredible journey we're going to be talking um like we said about a prospect centric approach to sales outreach so i guess before we go through some discussion points do you want to just explain what you mean by that um or your like your your take on that um definition wise i guess yeah um, I think I fully am believing that if you keep your prospect in the center of absolutely everything you do, it's one way to filter, to kind of keep your North Star. There's so many different ways that we can always tie it back to the prospect. Um, and I also think that there's a very unique, authentic way of selling. If you have your prospect in mind, um, that doesn't come off as selling. And that's the goal, you know, is that, um, yes, you want to be making the deals, closing the deals and, you know, finding those new use cases. But ultimately, at the end of the, the day, you're also there to help and you're also there to really serve a purpose. Um, and I think getting, you know, having that prospect in mind and getting to the meat of what it is that they care about and how you can help them in the most authentic way i think really is the way to to go about it yeah, yeah we've um in the last couple of episodes actually we've had um a couple of like conversations about um sales almost sales reps almost should focus on becoming a trusted advisor and that all sort of links into this prospect centric approach of not coming across as a overly salesy sales rep that's just in it for the money and the commission and actually you're there to help someone solve a problem first and foremost so yeah, that's um. I think the the market seems to be shifting um nicely in that direction. With I'm seeing a lot more of the reps that have a personality and are less salesy actually seem to be growing in terms of their personal brand and the success that they seem to be having. So yeah, it's all good to see. All good to see. So yep. I guess in terms of the place to start, then would be if you're prospect centric you need to understand your prospects right so yep. do you want to just talk us through how you and the team think about understanding the prospects so that you can actually start um, being more focused on them as individuals or them as um, customers absolutely yeah i think the first thing that you need to do is 
understanding your prospect is really figure out what it is that they care about. And you're looking at this from so many different angles. You're looking at their role. You're looking at their title. Um, you know, you're looking at their tenure. You're looking at their responsibilities and what their potential initiatives are. And again, you know, I say this kind of with a grain of salt because everything that you're going into, you know, these conversations, these emails, these calls, everything that you have is always a hypothesis. You know, we've we've been all been hounded, I'm sure, of the, you know, the over aggressive car salesman trying to sell you on a warranty that, you know, knows exactly what you need. And it's, you know, you, no one likes to be told what they need. Um, that's when you'll see the walls come up. That's when you'll see the pushback begin. Um, so going in and understanding that even if you are 99% sure that this is what this person is caring about, or this is what their goals are this year. It's always going in with a question because there's always so much more to learn. Um, you know, kind of going back to some of the different elements of understanding, I think you need to look at, for example, the role. Um, you know, you shouldn't be talking to end users about saving money. You know, they're not going to care. They're caring about saving time. They're caring about being able to clock out at the hours that they're supposed to. They're caring about, you know, keeping their jobs right now in this economy where so many companies are experiencing layoffs. It might just be that they want to get their job done and they're struggling to do so. So understanding really who you're talking to, how you're talking to them, what they're caring about, I think is obviously number one. Um, as well as understanding, you know, and I know we'll probably get into it a little bit later when we talk a little bit more about, you know, personalizing things. But I also think that personalizing based off of that person's role. I mean, for example, if you look at something like a use case like supply chain, one person might think, OK, I know what supply chain is. I've got it all figured out. It's, you know, the movement of a product from, you know, space A to space B. But there are so many different use cases. There's so many different roles and so many different things that people care about within the supply chain. There's merchandising, there's inventory, there's um, sell through, there is visual merchandising, there's logistics, there's, you know, partner and supplier diversification. And so being able to understand those different elements of one individual use case and how to talk to each individual that is within those different roles, I think is the very foundation of, you know, making sure that your prospects are number one. I was going to, got to jot it down here that we were going to speak about active listening, which always, um, it's always an interesting one because there's a misconception that everyone, know, everyone knows how to listen properly. Um, now you're a, you've got a team working for you. Is, is it something that people have the innate ability to when they first come into the role or is it something that you have to, coach and they learn and they get better at it over the course of a, a year, two years? Yeah, I think people have, it's something that they either have a seat of or not. I think it's something that you can get better at, but I think that everybody also has the opportunity to get better, myself included at active listening. Um, you know, it's such a huge thing that if you're constantly thinking about what you're going to say next, you're missing so much about the conversation. Um, and so I think, you know, part of that is going to be that learned side of things, which is, you know, knowledge, it's expertise, it's, um, you know, being able to master what, you know, whatever it is that you're selling or that role or that, like I mentioned, the understanding of somebody's role. Um, but there is the other side of things where it's partially removing your ego. You know, if you can remove your ego and truly just be there in that space with that person and listen to what they have to say, whether you want to hear it or not, I think that's a part of active listening as well. And some people have that and some people don't. So I think there's an ability to get better at it. Um, but I don't think it's something that everybody is born with. No. No, I'm going to, I was going to give an example of an area that I um, typically fall down on or an area that I can improve on, but in doing so, it's actually a very good example of what I was going to say. So I was, I, I see myself as a good listener, but what I tend to do, which is, I would probably say is a bad thing is someone will say something to me that I'm engaged with and then I'll, and then I'll say, oh yeah, I've done that before. And I'll, I'll almost switch it by agreeing with them by linking it back to myself which is a potentially i don't know if selfish is the right word for it or not selfish but self-indulgent way of engaging and listening and that's exactly what i've just done on this podcast now is switched it back which is self-indulgent do you uh, what, what's your take on it like 
does it come across as self-indulgent if or does it show that you're actively listening you're relating to the topic by empathizing with the place that they've been yeah i think there's a time and a place um i think that and there's a way to do it as well you know i think that if you immediately take what somebody is saying and you bring it back to yourself and you say, well, this is my experience and this is what I do, what I would do, or this is how I've done it in the past. And you leave it there. I think that's where it can go wrong. However, if you, like you mentioned, Jamie, you know, if you say, Hey, look, I've been there. I understand what you're going through. You empathize with them. You let them know that you've experienced their pain. But then again, in, on the tone of being prospect centric, you turn it back around and you relate it back to them. Hey, I've been there. I understand what you're going through. I don't want you to have to, you know, continue at the you know pace that you're going or continue at the status quo that you're experiencing right now. Let's work together to find a solution because I was able to find one and I'm pretty confident that I can find one for you as well. So I think so that that's switching it back is, is really that key element. Yeah. So it's just the delivery to make sure that the the self-indulgence brings you down to the same level of understanding as your prospect rather than just trying to, I think the phrase is one-upping, isn't it? If yeah, I've done that, but we, we flew first class instead of business class, like rather than one-upping someone of like, oh yeah, we had a prospect who had that before, but their problem is way worse than your problem. So as long as you come down to their level, it, it's, it's a tick in the box, it's fine. Absolutely. And I think that's where it adds in that element of being human, right? You know, we've all experienced problems. We've all had to, you know, work through them. We've all had to overcome them. And I think that that's showing your prospect that, hey, I've been there. I've, I've been in a situation that is, you know, less than perfect, but I was able to get myself out. And I think it's kind of that, that awareness of, you know, I may or may not have a solution for you. Let's work together and see if this is something that we can find. However, you know, and kind of going back to what you said earlier, you know, coming from this consultant kind of place, um, you know, it might not work for you. And if it doesn't work for you, that's fantastic. Going back to active listening, let's try, you know, I will continue to try to find a solution for you and it may not work, but at the end of the day, I'm here and I'm here to help. Yeah. Okay. So they, in, we've we've understood the prospect, I guess, engaging with the prospect in a customer centric way would be the next things. But first and foremost to that would, or first part of that would be meeting your prospects where they're at, which is customer centric in itself that, you know, I don't know, a, a, an example would be, um, really keen to talk to you about this. Um, can you do it on, um, WhatsApp and someone says, well, I don't use WhatsApp and you go, well, that's where I want to have a chat with you that's not meeting your prospect where they're at. So do you want to just um, talk us through how you guys handle that, how you've done that in the past and the best way to figure out where that should be? Absolutely. Um, first of all, you have to, again, it all comes down to what I said kind of at the beginning is putting yourself in the shoes of your prospect. You know, who are you talking to? Is it an end user? Is it a vice president? Um, you know, if you think about the role of a vice president, um, you know, they have a lot on their plate. They're responsible, especially for some of these larger organizations that we're prospecting into. They're responsible for so many people, so much budget, so, you know, such a large chunk of the business. So you have to think about how they operate and what you would be doing if you were a vice president. So one of the things that I do with my team is I let them know, like, you know, it is a okay to send a bump to an email on a Saturday morning at 10 a.m. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be working. Like, go ahead and schedule that email. But if I was the vice president before I signed, you know, off for the entire week and was able to really disconnect from my work, one of the last things that I would do is I would go through everything in a quiet time when I had the ability to really pick through and prioritize not just, you know, the things that I had handled last week, but the things that I was looking forward to in this upcoming week. Um, that might involve being on my computer at a Saturday morning and saying, okay, this is what I know I'm coming into on Monday. Um, you know, again, if you are coming from an authentic place where it's, hey, I'm here to help, you're not sending a big beefy email on Saturday where you're introducing a use case and, you know, solutions and yourself and your relationship already. You might just be sending a bump of, hey, I figured you were busy, wanted to get this in front of you again. Let me know if there's a better time. You know, I'm more than happy to work with a personal assistant if that's easier for you. Um, again, you're meeting them where they're at. You're not demanding their time. You're just letting them know, hey, I'm still here. Um, you know, I think that the biggest thing as being in sales is our job is to productively disrupt somebody's day. However, we have to think about what, how we're doing that, when we're doing that. Um, the other thing that I really like doing is, you know, for example, thinking about 
in the summertime when people are normally on vacation, where are you meeting them? Are they going to be answering their office phone? Probably not. They're probably going to be on LinkedIn because what do we all have in front of us? Our phones. And so they're probably going to be on LinkedIn because at the core of what LinkedIn is, is it's a social networking site. So meet them where they're at on LinkedIn, but offer them the out. Offer them, hey, if you're on vacation, if you're busy right now, I'm more than happy to circle back in a few weeks. Let them know that you are also human. You also take vacations. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is I'm a huge proponent of adding in a self schedule link. You know, I'm the type of person I know our entire generation is kind of shifting to the point where, you know, it's kind of obsolete to pick up the phone and actually have a conversation with somebody. You know, if there's a way to schedule a link, um, you know, or schedule a time or schedule an appointment, I will take that out nine times out of 10. Um, so do that as well for your prospect and think about what you would like, how you would like to be sold to. You know, if you don't want to have to pick up the phone or, you know, respond back to that voicemail, chances are your prospect doesn't want to either. And so meeting them where they're at, even if they are an end user, even if they are a VP, give them the option to schedule time with you at 11 p.m. at night. Judgment free, you know, doesn't mean responding to an email and seeing a timestamp. It means clicking a link, booking a time. So I would say those are probably the top three things. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, so we sell to sales reps, so it's a lot easier for us to meet our prospects where they're at. Because, like you said, it's LinkedIn. It's so much easier. But for other industries and verticals and products and services, it can be a lot more difficult. That might be a Rev Genius community. It might be um, um, Pavilion. It could be um, at a club, a physical, you know, location where where these people um, these people hang out. But yeah, it's interesting what you were saying about the. It's not just the where it's also consider the um the place the time the the mindset that that they're in i think i was speaking to um my uh, ceo or founder funnily enough um months and months ago and he used to work in recruitment and he primarily was i think an exec search so vps directors and c-suite and stuff recruiter and he used to ring or send an email at like 5 a.m and the reason he did that was because he knew that they would be pretty much at their desks by 7, 7.30 a.m. So at five o'clock, they were already awake. They were potentially going for a swim. They were in the gym. They were sort of going for a run or whatever. By ringing pre that, often he wouldn't get diverted to a gatekeeper or a PA. He would potentially get straight through to them or they would see the email. And because they hadn't started their day, he would get much more attention uh, or much more of their focus and i thought that was a yeah that's a very good example of um the, the time one and then the right. scheduling yeah 100 percent. we use chili piper um we onboarded with them a few months and we haven't looked back i actually spoke to arthur um arthur castillo um last week um for, for an episode of the podcast and yeah, yeah it's i schedule all the podcast stuff through Chili Piper. And it's like, if you want to book in for a kickoff, here's my link. Here's a link yep. to choose your podcast recording slot. Game changer. Like, and yep. the reschedule links in there. It's like, if you, like, if you can't make the podcast, it's completely your, your ball court. It's an extra curricular. Schedule it when you want. Exactly. It's 100%. It's, that's probably, uh, that, that Chili Piper scheduling has been, that's probably the most modern buying journey green tick for me at the minute. Absolutely. And adding it in non-traditional places too. You know, LinkedIn doesn't have a place to hyperlink, but how can you add that link into a LinkedIn message? You know, you can shorten a link through Bitly. You can make it, you know, as visually appealing as possible and you can add that in there as well. So again, meeting them where they're at, not just on the platform that they're at, but also the form that they're at and going back to what you're saying, thinking about the psychology, the timing of where they're at, you know, that little sweet spot that you have right before their day begins, right before people start pinging them, right before, you know, their first meeting starts, that's when you have to target them. That's when you should be disrupting their day. And uh, the second it starts to feel like a chore or work, that's when you, you've you lost it. So I think it, for me, I usually, um, I use the pepper emoji, which is what Chili Piper use, the chili pepper emoji. And I'll put, here's my pepper emoji link. And people yep. know, most people in our industry at least know what that is. And they're like, bam, that's going to be super easy for me to complete. I'll do that now. And that's, um, yep. yeah, very, very good point. Now, in terms of um, humanization and personalization, I know you touched on personalization, um, but what um, considerations, tactics should you be running through your head or should you be em employing um, in terms of engagement with your prospects? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a ton of different, again, ton of different elements of how you're doing it. You know, personalization, 
I think, you know, what I like to tell my team is there's, it's, it's a fine line we walk, you know, in sales. It's making sure, you know, because everything, again, going back to that supply chain use case, for example, everything is a hypothesis. So, you know, going in and making sure that we're sending something that would be relevant to any one of those people in that, you know, that role, if they don't have any specifics around their LinkedIn or, you know, they don't have any of their initiatives, you know, clearly stated, sometimes you're going in pretty blind and you're just trying to kind of shoot in the dark and see if you hit something. So going in general, I think there's nothing wrong with that, but also making sure that the things you're mentioning do address, you know, something that would be beneficial for every single person in one of those roles. Um, but also acknowledging that, you know, I'm not taking the easy way out. I'm not just going to your LinkedIn and typing your actual role down. I, I understand what you're talking about. Maybe you're talking about forecasting or you're mentioning something about, hey, you know, the holidays are coming up. I want to just make sure that your plan that, you know, you have a set plan for that. Would love to see where we can support. Um, so going wide, but also going specific, I think it's a very fine line. I would say for the humanization element, you know, I see so many emails and I get so many, you know, cold calls and cold emails, even to, you know, my inbox where they don't have my name correct. And it's small details like that. Um, you know, my email, my first name is in my email. So if you're sending it to my email, you should probably be getting the spelling of my first name correct. It's just a very small detail. Um, if I see that, I'll immediately delete. Um that there's so many different details there. I think, you know, in this world where we're moving more towards, you know, LLMs and AI, I think it's showing that you are human. You know, when you call somebody and it's a Friday or, you know, maybe it's you're coming off of a long weekend, I think there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, look, I know I called you out of the blue. I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, if you have two minutes, like, I would love to talk to you and get this cold call over because I'm sure you're just as excited to go through this as I am. I'm, you know, we're heading into a long weekend here, so I'll, I'll let you enjoy your weekend. Or, you know, if it's early in the morning saying something like, Hey, you know, I, I'm just about to have my second cup of coffee. Things are about to get a lot better here in just a minute. So let's, let's go on into it, you know, before I start talking too fast. Um, adding in that human element, I think is, is, is key. You know, people don't want to buy from, robot. They want to buy from a human. They want to feel that connection to who they are buying from. They want to feel like they can come to you and ask you questions. Um, so I think that that is huge. And in the how, I think, you know, I'm a huge proponent of scheduling out emails and making sure that they are really beautiful before you send them. Um, however, again, taking a look at the details, don't schedule them out at you know, 9am, that's going to show that like, you're almost like a robot. Anybody, you know, all these scheduling systems can schedule out at 9am or 905 or 910. You know, why don't you schedule an email out at 903? Show that you're a human. Even if you are scheduling the email, hey, I'm sending this to you at 903. I'm disrupting your day, just like I'm trying to reach out to you. Um, it also, going back to pro being prospect centric, it makes that prospect feel like you're not, they're not one in 300 of people that you're reaching out to. They're one person. And you've taken the time, if you're doing all of these things, to understand their role, you know, kind of throw out a couple of bones and set your hypothesis out there and see if you can warrant a response. But you're also making them feel really special. And I was going to just think in when you were talking about getting your name wrong, I've had so many emails where they say, Hey, Pagan, and I'm, or Hey, Pagan, Jamie. And I'm like, Oh, that's just automation gone wrong there. Delete yep. exactly the same as you. Um, but I, I was speaking with um, Jen at Lavender um, about sort of like the humanization and things and the way you, the way you write emails and how it comes across and the, the perception of someone reading that. And I think one of the great tips that was very similar to what you were saying there is actually in this weird world where you have to prove that you're human uh, in a world of AI, which is bad, like to think that you actually have to show that you're human nowadays is, is ridiculous. But it was, yeah. it was why talk to someone in a language that you wouldn't talk to your partner, your colleague. So when, if you looked at your, emails your last email sent to a colleague you would probably use like shorthand it'd be really uh, succinct direct sentences and you might say cheers but or just bye or thanks you wouldn't say all the best or i hope you are well and it was like all this this way of like talk to people how they would like and how or how they talk to other people and you're going to get 
much better responses short sweet to the point um and that was yeah really really interesting like aligned perfectly with what you were um what you were just saying there do you you have any um personal favorite um sort of personalization or human humanization touches that have worked really well for you and the team yeah i think one of the things that i like doing the most is pausing and really showing my prospect that I care about them. Um, if I get somebody on the phone, I don't go right on in. I, I ask them, Hey, happy Wednesday. How's, how, how have you been? And I think that that's the biggest thing is even if I've never talked to this person, that person's going to say, wait a minute, how have I been? You know, when was the last time I talked to this person? Why are they asking me? Why do they care about how I've been? Um, you know, that's, that's kind of what I lead with is that care, that genuine, that authenticity. Um, because chances are, if they say I've been, I've been horrible, you know, I'm going to address that as well. You know, and I've had people say, you know, Hey, I've been better. Hey, yeah. What's going on? Talk to me about it. You know, sometimes people just, you know, in, in today's world where, like you mentioned in the automatic scheduling, you know, if you are talking to a human, sometimes people just want to be listened to. Um, and it might not be relevant to what it is that you have to say to them, but if you take the time and you're playing by their rules. Again, you're making everything all about them. And sometimes you're listening to the fact that, you know, they had to drop their kid off at, you know, kindergarten and their, their, their kid cried, you know, for 10 minutes and was hanging on their leg. You know, they're going to be a lot more inclined to listen to what it is that you have to say if you just spent five minutes listening to what it is that they have to say as well. So I think just adding in, like you said, talking to somebody that you would talk to a friend, you know, how have you been? What's going on? And I think that really, that will stop people on their day because so many salespeople have an agenda and don't really care about anything else but achieving their own agenda. Yeah, and I'd say um, I'm doing that thing again when I try and empathize and understand. But I was was speaking to someone earlier uh, on LinkedIn and um, she asked a question of just, is there anything that I need to prep ahead of time? And I said, no, no homework, go and enjoy the sun. We don't get it very often. We got talking about the the weather, and then I sent her a, uh, an image of a um, a sweet in the UK called a squashy. I don't know if you've got it in the US. It's basically half pink, half white. And I said, I'm going to go and enjoy the sun, but I don't tan. This is typically what I end up looking like because I burn, and it's basically a harsh red red line with white skin. And and that was someone I had never spoken to before. And I sent them a picture right. of a sweet to compare my awful tan um, to you know her enjoying the sun. And I think it's, it's that because I have no shame when it comes to just talking to people and like potentially embarrassing myself but who cares right exactly and if that's who you are you know in your friend group or with the people that you're closest to why not let that come through on the phones you know or let that come through in your emails um there's no rules to how things are done you know and i think um by being more human i think you know the the worst calls that i've ever heard are scripted they're formal. They don't have any type of humanization in them. Um, you know, and I think the the more that we're able to be ourselves, the more that people are able to actually identify with us. It's all, it all goes back to exactly what you were just saying about circling it back and bringing it back to yourself. I think people want to see themselves in the people that they're buying from. So that's, you know, it's a great technique. It's a great way. And, and it sometimes feels weird at first. Um, but, you know, the more casual that you are on the phone, the more you let your personality shine through, I think the better. Again, don't, you know, go in completely unprepared and just, you know, want to just shoot it with that person, you know, but have a goal um, and be prepared to sometimes throw, you know, your agenda to the wayside and just listen to them. Yeah, and I think um, especially in sales uh, as an industry, the more you can do to show that you are a genuine a nice caring warm person rather than a cold hearted shark in terms of sales that's that's only going to help isn't it and you might you might yeah. feel oh am i letting my guard down are they going to take me seriously but if i was buying a piece of software i don't know chili piper let's use that example um bought from heather leo at chili piper she was brilliant super chilled like would always talk about um personal life and things like that and like, she's recently had a baby and all of that and that was what felt that was what made the 30 minute demos and all that sort of stuff far more memorable in terms of actually, Oh, that was actually a really good chat. I now trust them. I'm now, um, I've now got affinity with the brand. I quite like that brand. I, even though the product's the same, you're like, yeah, but that's, they they were really nice. And it's, it's a weird, like psychological shift, isn't it? 
Yeah. And it's, and you know, every single time you're reaching out to that person, you're, you're, you're a representative of whatever it is that you're selling. And so you become that for that person. Um, you know, one of the things as an SDR myself that I really love to do and I would aim to do is to make my prospects laugh in any way, shape or form. Cause if I could make them laugh, what would happen chemically in their brain is endorphins were released. And there was a trigger every time they saw my name on email, every time they heard my voice, every time we hopped on a meeting, those endorphins, your brain remembers that. So, you know, it makes it makes you happy when you see that person, you know, so if you can make somebody giggle, if you can make them laugh, um, you know, especially in the mundane tasks of, you know, just work and our workflows, you know, the chances are they're going to want to confide in you, like you mentioned, trust you, buy from you, look forward to those calls from you, show up to the meetings that, you know, you book with them. So it's it's a ripple effect. So any particular jokes you would use, tactics to make someone laugh? I'm putting you on the yeah. spot now. Yeah, exactly. Um, kind of going back to the coffee reference, I'm kind of a coffee connoisseur, you would say. Um, and I would always talk about, you know, I would always ask my prospects, hey, how is how's your day going? You know, how have you been? And then in turn, they would they would ask me, you know, great. Well, how has yours been? And I said, you know, I'm about to head into my second cup of coffee. So things are about to get a lot more you know, productive, a lot better around here. And I had one of my reps ask me, do you really drink that much coffee? I said, no, I don't. But, you know, the goal is to make them laugh. The goal is to make them feel comfortable for them to lower their barriers so we can really have a genuine conversation about how we can help and support. Top three coffees, in your opinion. Oh, gosh. Top no, three I don't mean I don't I don't mean roast. Like if you say uh, Colombian dark, that's, you know, I think we're yeah. going to know a lot more about you. I mean, like frozen <laughs> frap, a cappuccino, a latte, like you're, you're, uh, you're more basic. What's your top three? I mean, I don't know if I've ever met a coffee that I don't like. Um, it depends on the day. You know, if, if you don't have a ton of time, it's like just give me espresso on ice. That'll that'll be fine. Um, otherwise, you know, I love a bougie coffee more than, you know, the next person too. So there's, there's anything lavender on, on the menu. I've been really into lavender again, it's summer. Um, but again, you know, Hey, it's, we're coming into fall. I'm trying to manifest the fall, even though very similar to you, it's pretty hot here. Um, so, you know, right now I'm into the pumpkin, I'm into the apple oh, yeah. I'm you know, I eat it up just as much as everyone else yeah. does. Pumpkin spice latte, game changer. Oh, until you I'm, look at the I'm calories. I'm not afraid to say I love it. Yep. Uh, until you look at the calories, 400, <laughs> 500 calories, and you're like, wow, that uh, just consumed 500 calories in about four minutes. Right. It's not the caffeine hyping you up. It's the sugar. Yep. <laughs> now, that, 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 that wasn't an intentional um, demonstration of how to empathize with your prospect, but that, would be, that was a, a very good example of listening to the fact they like coffee and doing yeah. that. Um, Roll with it. And the, yeah, it's, it's, I, I was, um, I've always said one of the best first date questions, like this, right. If I said to you, what's your favorite vegetable? You're going to spurs. You're going to sit there like, what? Vegetable. Right. Why, why, why are you asking what my favorite vegetable is? But you can learn a lot about a person by asking what their favorite vegetable is. So Absolutely. what is your favorite vegetable? Oh, I love broccoli. I think okay. the little mini trees, you know, mm -hmm. if you have a plate of it, it's like, I've got a forest on my plate here. It's good. good. I'm, I'm an asparagus yeah. man. I like an asparagus. Oh, okay. I wouldn't have taken yeah. you for an asparagus guy, but I see it now. What? Okay. What? What would you have had me down as? Like a potato or something? I don't know. Maybe like a squash kind of a guy. A squash. Okay. I do yeah. like a squash. Butternut see, squash. Yeah. Wasn't love it. Too, Roasted. Wasn't too far off. Yeah. Yeah. My mum always used to. Do, that's actually quite a good guess because my mum always used to do roasted trays of butternut squash, olive oil, salt, pepper, herbs. Lovely. Oh my gosh, we're coming up to, to lunchtime here. You're, mm. you're making my stomach growl over here. Yeah, it's coming, coming up to dinner time here, so it's perfect <laughs> timing. But anyway, anyway, back to the topic. Um, we we were going to finish off with like a building trust and credibility thing. Um, yep. There are a few topics that we had previously discussed, but in terms of building trust and credibility, we've said it's great. It's uh, an absolute must in, in today's um, yep. market, but... How do you guys handle it? How do, how have you handled it over the years? Tips, tricks, tactics? Yeah. You know, I think the big thing is, and I tell this to all of my reps, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. You know, that is the biggest thing. Um, you know, it kind of goes back to that human part too. You know, we are, we're here to sell. We're here to inform. We're here to help. Um, we're not here to be masters of all and knowers of all. There is nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know what? 
I'm 95% sure I can give you the correct answer, but I want to be 100% sure when I'm telling you something that, you know, could affect your business or could affect your workflow. Give me 24 hours. And, you know, having having that deadline, give me 24 hours. Let me just double check on this and let me get back to you. The last part of that is the integrity piece, actually following through within 24 hours and giving them that answer. You know, I would much rather have somebody that I'm purchasing from say, I don't know, but let me find out for you than to guess at something when I know you know, maybe I'm, I'm putting my feelers out um, and I'm making sure maybe I know the answer already, but I want to see how it is they respond to me. Um, again, adding in that human element, we are not supposed to play God here. We don't know everything, um, but being able to say, I'm not sure, let me find out from somebody who does know, or let me double check on that, I think is the number one way to build trust. Um, it seems counterintuitive, right? Because there's this misconception that in sales, we're supposed to know everything. We're not, we're human again. Um, we're not robots. People want to buy from humans. So why not give them that experience that they're looking for? I think that's the number one thing. Um, but also building trust and building credibility. You know, I think it's, again, it's, it's a fine line we walk. I think that especially for a company like Snowflake, where I'm at currently is I have use cases. I have customer examples that I can give. I'm more than happy to give those to my customers. However, it's, Again, if I'm giving them and I'm talking about another customer, I'm not talking about them. So, you know, I want to, sure, I can give you all of the information that you want to look through. You want to attend a webinar. Great. You want to, you know, talk to other customers. Great. I can do that. However, I'm going to circle it back to them and say, however, I would like to talk about, you know, similarities in these use cases that I'm sending you and how we can help your organization, how we can help your workflow, help you save money. Um, I think that's the big thing. I was um, when you were talking about that like counterintu a counterintuitive um, like approach. It seems that it would be a negative if you don't know the answer. It was I was chatting with um, Jen and Arthur, um, Jen Lavender, Arthur Chili Piper again, and they were speaking about this like anti sales, which is exactly what you say. It's almost like you open up and you say, "Look, our solution is is one choice." have you tried these three completely free things that may or may not help you first? I will help you try those. And if you still think you need our product or solution, I'm going to be here. And it's like that weird, like, no, no, don't, don't buy from me. Try this first. But it's one of the best ways that you said is owning up, putting your hands up, saying we might not be the best solution, whatever you want to do. It's one of the, it's the best tactic to disarm. I think is probably the right word, disarm your prospect in terms of actually gaining a bit of the power back by so i don't know what the word for it is it's like being so su not submissive it's kind of being submissive in being open and saying that you might not be the right solution or you right. might not know the answer it's taking that consultative approach that we talked about earlier it's it's giving them an out and it's coming from that place of authenticity right you know it's saying hey i know what i know what we can bring to the table however I also know that our solution isn't for everybody. I know it might not be the right time or it might, you might not have the budget or, you know, this might not actually be the solve. You might not need the full stack. You might just be looking for one small element. Um, and again, it all goes back to this trust. You know, they might not buy from you that day, but because they trust you, because they know that you're going to give them their, your honest opinion a year from now, when the time is right, or when they do have the budget, they're going to come back to you and they're going to want to buy from you specifically because you were able to help them essentially qualify yourself out. Um, I think that that's huge when I'm, you know, asking for meetings, I'm very open on saying, Hey, th this meeting might not be correct for you. This might not be the right time. Tell me if I'm wrong. I love to hear that I'm wrong. Um, but if I am wrong, let me help get you to where you need to be. What is it that you're looking for instead? So, yeah, to, I think to be content or to be relaxed in potentially being wrong is quite a good, good place to be. Like, it, you know, there's loads of sayings about don't let perfection get in the way of execution. And, you know, good is better. Good is better than perfect. If you never do perfect, all these sort of things, like you're not going to be right all the time. So if you're yep. wrong, some of the time, one, you're going to learn from it. And two, you're able to actually probably get more out of the deal anyway, because it will send you down the right path or it will close lost the deal. And it wasn't a deal in the first place. Exactly. 
I would rather purchase from somebody who is honest with me than somebody who's pushy with me. Um, and I think, again, you know, at the at the core of what we're doing in sales is we're building relationships. Like I mentioned, it might not be a yes right now, but it might be a yes in the future. And if you're honest, um, if you're, you know, humble about what it is that you're offering and what you're selling, you know, that's what's going to establish a relationship down the future. That's the building that long term, you know, foundation that we're looking to build in sales. It's not that, you know, commission breath that we're coming at everybody. You know, I have it's the end of the quarter. I need to book my commission. I need to make this across the line. It's not about that. It's about selling. It's about helping. Yeah, it's interesting. You said the commission breath there. I've only I've only heard one other person say that, and that was Arthur at Chili Piper. So is that quite a well known Americanism of like commission breath? Is that a thing? I mean, I think it's a saying that I mean, I I've, I've heard it a couple of times, but I think it's it's something we've all experienced, right? You know, like mm -hmm. I mentioned, it's that person that calls you about your car warranty and it's out or, you know, it's that person that wants to upsell you on your internet and they don't know what your usage is. It's it's what happens when you go in with a hypothesis and you aren't able to admit that you're wrong or you don't go in and, and ask questions. It's when you're not inquisitive. I think, um, you know, when you're running your own agenda and when you're almost steamrolling your prospect, that's what happens is you have this commission breath and, um, you know, I can spot it. I can smell it a mile away and I shut it down and it brings me joy to shut it down as opposed to, you know, that person actually could have been selling something that could have made my life a lot easier, a lot better, but I wasn't going to listen to it anyway because of the way that they approached me. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I think I'm going to have to start using it in the UK or trying to get some of the, the team here to use it because it is a, it is a very apt description of, uh, of it happening. Um, okay. We've gone through loads of, um, um, scenarios, tips, tricks, tactics, strategies. Um, what would you say um, for those that have listened are like, I know the three biggest takeaways in terms of that prospect centric approach of just doing it? What are the three most important things? Yeah, I would say use the filter. Why would I care about this? You know, with everything that you're doing, with how you're emailing, with um, when you're emailing, with how you're talking to people. Why would I care about this? How would I feel about this? You know, that's, I think, the biggest thing. If you're going in with a script or you're going in with some questions and if you take a look at them and, you know, somebody asked you those questions and you would be turned off by it, don't ask those questions. That's the very basis of it. Sell as if you sell in the way that you want to be sold to um, because we're all human. And, you know, that's that's the number one thing to lead with. I would say that's going to be number one. Um, it's OK to not know the answer. It's OK to mess up. It's OK to say, oh, you know what? I'm wrong. I apologize. I'm wrong. Um, don't be afraid to fall on the sword. Um, however, like I said, follow up, bring that integrity piece in. Um, I would say that that's going to be you know, probably number two. Um, and number three. Let's see. Keep your prospect as your North Star. You know, think about what they care about. Put yourself in their shoes. I know I've said that a couple of times, but truly put yourself in their shoes. Um, you know, when you don't know if you're going off of nothing and you have nothing, that, you know, going back to, you know, kind of some of the research that you have to do when it comes down to sales, go to Google. Figure out, you know, what does this position care about, you know, find a job description so that you can better put yourself in their shoes so that you can use that as a filter to look at those questions that you have to inform your hypothesis, to see if you would even want those questions to be asked to yourself if you had those initiatives in mind. I think all three of those things fit together great. Um, but, you know, you can't have one without the other or else it's going to come off inauthentic. And that's the biggest thing. Perfect. Well, I've got one more question. Um, following up the the coffee and the vegetables um <laughs> podcast and nominate who do i need to get on the podcast next and why yeah i have been taking a ton of training lately um from i'm not sure if you've heard of him from kevin dorsey his name is here he goes by kd um, he is currently the svp of sales and partnerships at bench accounting um but he is fantastic top notch. He talks about so many different elements of sales um, when it comes to managing a team, to hiring, um, to, you know, putting ownership back onto a rep, to the psychology of how we're talking to our prospects. Um, he is a true game changer. 
and um, is really just innovating within the field as well. So definitely would would recommend reaching out to Kevin. Wicked. Well, I've just jotted his name down. I've probably spelled it wrong, but I've jotted his name down um, and we will do, we'll do our best to get, um, get him on the episode. But appreciate mm-hmm. you taking the time. Um, I know, uh, like you said, it's been absolutely manic of late um, everywhere. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you taking the time and, and sharing um, some of your wisdom. Yeah, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to do so, Jamie. I appreciate it. And um, hopefully those listening or watching will have gained um, some sort of uh, advice that they can take away. If you have, please leave a good review, um, subscribe, follow, and uh, we will see you in the next episode. Thanks.